Welcome back from your break. And um, what a wonderful uh, time of uh, greeting one another that was. A special welcome, uh, I should have done this at the, uh, you know, my greeting. A special welcome to extended family members who are joining us here uh, for the, our celebration. Uh, it's always wonderful to welcome you back and to see familiar faces uh, here. And as well, those of you that are not able to join us as we have a number of people um, who are either presently uh, for health reasons, not, not able to come, uh, or other, uh, if you're joining us via stream, Merry Christmas, we miss you and we look forward to seeing you uh, in the new year. Uh, please open in your scripture to Luke's gospel, chapter 2. In just a moment, I'll be reading the story of Jesus' birth that Luke recorded in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We'll read through the first seven verses, as since we've already read those to you. And then when I comment on verses 8 through 14, we'll reread them to familiarize ourselves again with this. Before we read the scripture, let me make one brief introductory comment. This is the fourth week of Advent, and so Christians throughout the country, if not the world, have been celebrating the last four weeks that something wonderful in the words of one pastor, is coming. Advent means, in his words, something wonderful is coming. It literally means the word coming or arriving. And so Advent is that part of the Christian calendar where believing Christians in Jesus Christ as a real person who is also our Savior and the Lord came for the first time, and so his birth is what we commemorate today. But there's another sense, isn't there, for Christians who gather, and that is that we prepare our hearts by making room for him and inviting his, his coming, if you will, through his word and by his presence to freshly fill our lives, because it's not just the innkeeper right, who has no rooms available for Mary and Joseph and the soon-to-be-born baby. It's our lives. They become busy, and our hearts, like an inn, become so busy that there's no room for a celebration of him. Although you're here, and so clearly you have made room, but it can be hard, can it? And spiritually, of course, in addition to that, Christians also anticipate a second advent, and that is his promised return. When Jesus comes back, not as a baby, beautiful and miraculous as that is, but he comes back as the king to make all things right. To turn tears, as one poet has written, into smiles. And to restore peace to a world like ours that knows little of it. Christmas means something wonderful is coming. And this morning we get to look at that from the perspective of Luke chapter 2. John's, or Luke's, Description of those details and then the angel's announcement to the shepherds that morning. Beginning in verse 1. This is God's word. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called 
Bethlehem. Because Joseph was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Thanks be to God for these words. Let's pray. Father, as you know, Christmas announces a surprising gift to each of us. As the prophet foretold of old and the angel announces again in the passage we will read shortly, to you is given a savior who is Christ the Lord. May the surprising truths of this passage and more importantly, a heightened expectation that something wonderful is coming. Fill our hearts and our minds as we consider the lowliness of Christ's birth and the heavenly reaction to his birth and our response this Christmas Eve in 2023. For your glory and our peace, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Before we look at the text, I couldn't help but stumble upon this statement in a devotional Linda and I have been reading this week as part of our celebration of Advent. Trillia Newell, who's a children's storybook writer, noted that earthly gifts can leave us unsatisfied and wanting more. So I thought, what are some earthly gifts that, in the eyes of many, are the worst gifts they've been given Christmas morning? Now, I don't know if these are gifts on your list, and so I mean no offense by these. I'm just telling you what the survey says. A survey of 2,000 adults done after Christmas last year that was published in several newspapers. Worst gifts given Christmas morning. Number one, diet plans. (laughs) That's the clubhouse leader. Number three, I skipped number two because I didn't understand what number two was. Number three, bad romance novels. And number seven, soap on a string. (laughs) I haven't received any of these, but apparently a lot of Americans have. So what do you do with a bad gift? Doesn't your mind go there? Well, 20% of those surveyed who identified these bad gifts said they rewrap it and re-gift it to someone else. I love that. That's beautiful. 18%, not the 20, 18, hide it somewhere in their house and forget about it. Forget about it. A whopping 10% donate their bad gifts to charity. Not sure how the charities feel about that, but. And retailers tell us, ready for this? That upwards of 40% of the gifts that they have returned to them, they do not restock, nor do they resell. They destroy them. That's why they make shipping so high for these returns, because they really don't want you to return the gift. 
I received a bad gift from a family member last year. Can I share what that was? They're here. <laughs> and it's not that it wasn't a thoughtful gift, but I, I didn't have any use for it. And, and, and I think it's because I'm old and I'm a creature of habit and I lack imagination when it comes to gifts that were thoughtfully. But I was given coasters that were made out of what appeared to me to be like shale. So they were black coasters. And they had stamped on them, I think it was sports logos. And why I am a sports fan, as you know, and I tried to use these coasters as I did, I found that I was more loyal to my older coasters. My Red Sox rules coasters and the, the knit coasters my mom gave me years ago. And, and so these, these shale coasters wound up getting not only pushed to the side, but reboxed. And no, I'm not regifting them. And stored away for another day. Earthly gifts can leave us unsatisfied and wanting more. What I'd like to show you this morning is there are two things in this passage that this tells us Christmas means, two things at least, and Luke helps us to actually think about what Christmas actually means. And in both cases, they are surprising truths. Even though they may be familiar to many of you, they are nonetheless surprising truths because of what is being described here. And so, these are good gifts because as we reflect on them, they're completely unexpected due to the surprising nature of them. So my outline is simple. Two surprising truths surrounding the birth of Jesus Christ, the lowliness of his birth, the lowliness of his birth, and the heavenly reaction to his birth. The lowliness of his birth and the heavenly reaction to his birth, which taken together tells me this. Christmas announces a surprising gift to the undeserving. And those words are chosen carefully. Christmas announces a surprising gift to the undeserving. To you is given a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So let's consider... The first surprising truth, the lowliness of his birth, and work towards this ultimate surprising gift, the birth of Christ, our Savior, the Lord. Luke begins by drawing our attention in verse 1 to the decree of Augustus that in all the Roman Empire... Each should register, each to his hometown, and this would be for the purpose of taxation. And there we have it from sacred scripture, another painful reminder of Roman oppression that Israel was experiencing in their own land. They were, in essence, in captivity in their own land, for they were ruled by Rome. So these were dark days. Some would say these were the worst of days. And this decree by Augustus would require Joseph and a very pregnant Mary to journey from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem. Now, though Augustus assumes, as we would assume, 
where we Caesar, that he wields ultimate authority. Luke portrays Augustus as the unwitting agent of God. For his decree results in the fulfillment of a promise, we would call it a prophecy, but a promise nonetheless, spoken by Yahweh through Micah, the prophet, 700 years prior to this moment. And we read that earlier. I'm going to paraphrase it. First, uh, chapter 5 of Micah. This will be projected behind me. Jim, this is quote number one. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days, verse 5, and he shall be their peace. So the decree of Augustus was actually the means, humanly speaking, of placing Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem for the fulfillment of this promise to Israel that from Bethlehem, would come forth a ruler, a shepherd, as Micah would describe him, which was a common motif for kings in the ancient world, a ruler, a shepherd, who would deliver his people from their enemies, and he not only would restore them, but he would be their peace. Luke describes then the birth of Jesus plainly and simply in verses 6 through 7. And while they were there, the time came for Mary to give birth, verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So, This verse affords me the opportunity to simply say this. This is not fiction, nor is it a fable, and therefore there's nothing romantic or idyllic about what I just read. Right? Swaddling cloth, which is, I had to look that up. It's a technical word. It's what a mother does with an infant when they're born. She wraps the infant gently in a cloth, tightly, but gently, so as to keep the infant warm and to create a sense of security. Swaddling cloths. Jesus the baby, the swaddling God. But maybe more striking is where he's born. It says he's born in a manger. It says she laid him in a manger. Literally, she laid him in a feeding trough for animals. Have you been in a barn recently? I have. Not this week, but... And there are many things that Barns stir within me. I like farmers, and I like the smell of farming, and I like farm animals, and I particularly like cows, as my kids know, because we now have two larger-than-life cows painted on the side of my favorite dairy in Bliss Dairy, Attleboro. But barns are not clean, and a feeding trough is not clean. And there is nothing, nothing idyllic or romantic about Jesus being born in a barn and laid to rest in a feeding trough if indeed he is the one fulfilling Micah's prophecy. A ruler, a shepherd, a king from of old will come forth and shepherd his people. He will defeat their enemies and he will rule them in peace. And this one is born and laid to rest 
in a feeding trough. Now, I consulted commentators on that, and they're all in agreement. It's a trough. It's a trough. It's not a cot. It's not what you see on Christmas cards. It's a trough that animals use daily to feed. The Son of God and the promise of peace he brings is born, listen for this, in a setting where animals were kept. And this is God's design. This is God's design. This is his design. This is his plan. Mary bears her firstborn son in a stable and places him in a feeding trough for animals that functions as his crib. And this scene and this setting for the birth of Jesus is a humble one. And it sets the tone for the rest of his life and for the rest of his ministry. Humility that characterized his birth Lowliness that characterizes birth. Ordinariness, I don't even know that's a word, that characterizes birth would be the pattern for the entirety of his life. He's not born in the temple in Jerusalem. That's where I would expect the Messiah to be laid to rest. He's not born in the palace in the capital city. He's born in a manger. And it is a sign for the shepherds as revealed by the angels. Verse 12. I do want to do some damage repair. And I think there's some ministry day for the extended family of this individual. Christians love, love to add myth to their recounting of, I do too, I'm sure. But the innkeeper. It says there's no room at the inn. It nowhere says that the innkeeper was hard-hearted. When Mary and Joseph came to him. It nowhere says that he was cold and unfeeling. How, where do we come up with this? The inn is full because people are returning to their birthplace to be registered for. And there's no aura. There's no, there's, there's no music playing when Mary and Joseph arrived that he would somehow. The inn is full. And this was God's design. Because the child born in the manger is a sign for the shepherds as revealed by the angels in verse 12. Whatever your understanding of Jesus Christ is, you and I need to think more deeply about this. It is unthinkable that the Son of God would be born there. Particularly this child. But it's not inscrutable because Paul would later tell us he laid aside his glory when he took on flesh. He laid aside his glory. He laid aside his glory. He laid aside any personal display of glory. He he laid aside his glory in order to be our Savior. That is awesome. And I wish I had the emotional capacity of my wife through my tears to show the marvel of that. The lowliness of his birth is also surprising, but maybe even more surprising is the heavenly reaction to his arrival, Luke 2, 8 to 14. Let's look, consider that. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, Pete, with whom he is pleased. The second surprising truth about the birth of Jesus is this, the heavenly reaction to his arrival. Heaven responds to the birth of the Son of God by announcing the identity of the child to a most unlikely audience. Luke draws our attention in verse eight to some nameless shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. They're working the night shift. These nameless shepherds. There's nothing unique about shepherds. So maybe that's why they're nameless. If anything, in the eyes of that culture, first century Israel, shepherds were considered outliers of society. They had a reputation for being untrustworthy in their speech, thieves, not people you invite to your your neighborhood block party if you're concerned about your china or your silverware. And it's an ordinary night, and we're not told how many, but the shepherds that are there are watching over their flocks in order to do what shepherds do, protect their flocks from predators and thieves. And suddenly, not gradually, suddenly, verse 9, an angel of the Lord appears to them, and the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of the Lord, the, the illuminating glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel says what he seems to have to say every time he comes in contact with people like me and maybe you, fear not, fear not. Now, I've always construed that fear not is because they're big and I'm not. They can fly and I can't. They were invisible a moment ago and now they're visible. You see where I go with that? It's, it's kind of more in keeping with like a Ridley Scott movie of Alien than it is with a scriptural account. But the reality is the reason angels have to say fear not when they come in contact with people like Bauer Evans is because they're holy and we're not. They keep counsel with the triune God. They're in his court, if you will, as scripture seems to reveal. And I don't. And so when an undeserving sinner like me encounters an angelic being that is holy, the response is fear. It's terror. It's, and there was nothing in the shepherd's job training or apprenticeship or previous work of employment that prepared this for this moment so the angel gives it a shot, and he says, I know you're going to be terrified, so I bring you what? News of a great joy. I don't know if they listened. I'm not sure I'd be listening. <laughs> but Luke recorded it. Fear not. I have good news of a great joy. That will be for all the people. And then verse 11. For unto you, shepherds, is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And note carefully in, in this news, the identity of this child revealed by the titles ascribed to the child by this angel. He is the Savior, meaning he will be the one who delivers or rescues us from peril. He is not only the Savior, he is the Christ. He is the long-awaited and anticipated and promised Messiah. He is the Christ, that is his title, and he is the Lord. He is the sovereign one who brings about our salvation. 
The reign of Caesar Augustus ended in AD 14 when he died. The angel is announcing that the reign of this child has never ended. Mary, the mother of Jesus, whose song we considered last week from Luke 1. There's a prophetic element in her song, even though it's rich in Old Testament references. She's seeing something inspired as it is by the Spirit about the future where she says, God has brought down the mighty from their thrones and those of humble estate will be exalted. She sang as if she knew, although it was the Spirit who was showing her that the baby in her womb would bring about a dramatic reversal where the mighty would be humbled and the humbled, finish it with me, will be exalted. And Jesus is the humble one who will be exalted. And where can the shepherds find this child? They can find this child not in a palace, not in the temple in Jerusalem. That may be where they would expect to find the Christ, the Savior, the Lord. They would find him not wrapped in royal splendor. They would find him wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a feeding trough in Bethlehem. And then suddenly a divine entourage appears, verse 13, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, too many to count, and they express a doxology to God. And they announce through their doxology God's gracious heart towards the undeserving glory, verse 13, to God in the highest, and on peace among those with whom he is pleased. I think what's surprising about this second truth is twofold. The first is the announcement is given to nobodies. The announcement is given to shepherds who are nobodies in the eyes of their culture. They don't have blogs. They don't host podcasts. They don't command audiences. They haven't written any books. They will not keep counsel with kings or queens or royalty. They do not do commerce. They are nobodies. And it's to them that the angels, and it's by divine design again. The humble Savior birth is announced to nobody. And the second surprising news is that with the birth of this baby, God's promised peace will come through his son to the undeserving and ill-deserving with whom he is pleased. It was hardly a silent night. When the angel saw the glory of the birth of Christ and revealed it to the shepherds so that we could see it too, there was no silent night. Heaven thundered with the chorus. I tried to picture who would the angels announce the birth of Christ to today. I'll fail in this comparison. I'm trying to think, who, who works a night shift that is maybe a little bored with what they do and is thinking about their next job, lateral move? Toll booth operators. There's still a few of them that are working. Manning those lonely toll booths in some part of Maine, Right? although we're trying to get the easy pass. Just another night. And yet we have lights on the highway, but all of a sudden there's a light that they can't ignore. And there's an announcement that they must hear. And they're the ones being told, tonight Christ the Savior, the Lord, is born. The whole scene The whole scene is full of surprises because it represents ordinary people. The whole 
birth narrative is filled with ordinary people, Joseph and Mary and shepherds who have been blessed by an extraordinary God. This is not a fable. This is not fiction. It's not romantic and it's not idyllic. It is the biblical account of the birth of Jesus, but it is only half the story. Amen? The purpose of his birth will ultimately, according to the Gospels, be his death. The focus of the New Testament, although it does account for his birth, thankfully, ultimately, focuses on what would take place at the end of his life on a hill called Calvary. The one who was born and laid in a wooden feeding trough would die as he had laid on a wooden cross and crucified. And all this was necessary because of his great love for us as our savior and our sin, my sin, which makes Christmas both troubling and disturbing as well as very hopeful and comfortable. Troubling and disturbing because the six pound, if that's how big he was, baby born in Bethlehem was born ultimately to die in my place as my savior, as my substitute. And Christmas confronts me with the reality that if I have an absence of peace with God, not subject to peace, but an absence of peace with God in terms of my relationship with him, where a conflict continue exists between a holy, unapproachable God and my failings and faults and selfishness and what Bible just simply says is sin, then I need a savior. And he has come to be that. Amen? Tim Keller, who is now with the Lord, wrote this in The Hidden Meaning of Christmas. This is quote number five, Jim, I believe. And in it, he's helping New Yorkers understand two myths that are raised up and object to the Christmas story. See if you agree. A God who was only holy would not have come down to us in Jesus Christ. He would have simply demanded that we pull ourselves together, that we be moral and holy enough to merit a relationship with him. A God that was an all-accepting God of love would not have needed to come to earth either. This God of the modern imagination would have just overlooked sin and evil and embraced us. Neither the God of good works, what he calls moralism, nor the God of acceptance, what he calls relativism, would have bothered with Christmas. Christmas surprises us because the living God, the true God, bothered with Christmas to deliver me from what is wrong in me and fix what is wrong in my relationship with God so that I could not only have what the Bible says is peace, but I could even by grace through faith in a relationship with Christ, the free forgiveness that he gives through faith, the new heart and the new birth that comes through that relationship, I could now begin to be a means of imperfect grace in all the broken relationships that characterize planet Earth. Beginning with just my immediate circle. He has provided his only son as the only savior that we desperately need. So Christmas is disturbing. So if it disturbs you that the one born in Bethlehem was born openly die in your place in order to deliver you from sin and its penalty, may then this comfort you as well. He has provided his only son as the savior we desperately need because scripture, he did so because he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son 
that whoever believes in him which should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. John 3, 16 and 17. John would later write, as he was serving churches, years later, in Asia Minor, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, there it is, the propitiation, the sacrifice, the sacrifice which atones for the penalty of sins committed against God. It satisfies God's wrath. It satisfies God's judgment. It removes it from us once and for all so that we then can be called beloved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. No wonder the angel announces, fear not, for I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. But don't read this next phrase too quickly. For unto you, to you, his birth and substitutionary death on the cross was done. For you, this most surprising of announcements surrounding his birth. To you, this announcement is made. See, it's not enough for us to simply say, I believe that. I believe that. That's true. It is not enough to know that his birth is not fable or fiction. You must know that he was born for you and for you and for you and for you and for you because he was born to die for me too. It can't just be, I believe that, unless we receive him for what he came to do. Amen? But for those who respond to his humble invitation, by God's grace, he leaves us amazed and filled with indescribable joy that the Father has provided his only son as the Savior you desperately needed because he loves you and he loves me and he loves you too. This announcement is unto you. For those who have not responded to this invitation, may I plead with you today, acknowledge your sinfulness. Acknowledge your own inability to do enough works to be reconciled to God. Acknowledge your good works are an attempt to be your own savior. Acknowledge your philosophy is just a philosophy, but it makes so little claims on your personal life. Acknowledge that Jesus is the savior who came for you. And by faith, he will take you by the hand. And in 2024, you will begin to see a transforming effect. And this Christmas will be a Christmas unlike any other, which will extend not only into 2024, but into your attorney as well. Because Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. Christmas my main point, announces a surprising gift to the undeserving. To you is given a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So as we return to singing and celebrating, we are singing and celebrating the birth of the one who came. Faith, which is ultimately a gift, but it has its source in the truth of God's invitation and word unlocks the treasure chest of God's peace. It's faith in the person and work of Christ as the Son of God by which the angels cry out, glory to God in the highest. I pray we all this day 
receive him as our peace. Let's pray. Lord, these these words we read in Luke's account of the birth of Jesus contains some surprising gifts for each of us. Perhaps it is the simple reminder that Jesus was born in humility, in lowliness, which makes him approachable in his holiness to us. Perhaps it is the reminder that the good news of great joy was first announced to nobody's shepherds, of which we, Lord, I, Lord, can say, I'm a nobody. But to me has come this news today. Perhaps it is the promise that he is our peace. And the peace that through faith in Christ and repentance of our sin first reconciles us to God and brings things into a right relationship now works in and out of us to bring peace to relationships that are broken or fractured or separated. Perhaps it is simply the reminder that the birth of Christ is only half the story. He was born in order to live an obedient life and die. But as the writer of Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, despised the shame of the cross and died for us. Whatever the reminder, Lord, we pray, lead us in both celebrating and sensing something wonderful is happening in Advent. May the promise of his first coming come true. As for faith, we believe and trust and worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let me stand.